Tech Talk Tuesday. Number 132. 132, yep. Got some stuff to tell you all about today. It's a big valve. I'll tell you some stuff about valve jobs today and some different reasons why we do valve jobs we do. Somebody give me a time and a sound check. Time and a sound check. Hey Greg, hey GB, Paul, Cash, that's a great name, 500. Woo woo, that's good. Six o'clock Eastern, five o'clock Central. Four o'clock over yonder by the hills. Might be three o'clock over there in the land of the fruit and nuts and people that are love uh, Hollywood and uh, I love California. And the Hawaiians and then the people east of us that are over in the Atlantic Ocean. Good to see all you guys and the ones down under. Hey Patrick, hey Jim. Good to see you guys, great. I, I brought a a big valve up here that I'm going to talk to you about. It's a big titanium valve. I'm going to talk to you about the valve angles on the valve. I'm going to talk to you about the strength and stability of the valve. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, different makeup of the different types of coatings and titanium. Um, this is just more if, if uh, you already know all this stuff. You can watch and play along. We appreciate you. If you don't know all of this stuff, please stay tuned because I am going to drop some information on you during this next few minutes that will be different than maybe you've heard before. Not because I'm smarter than anybody, but it's because I've done it for a long, long time. I had a really, really good friend of mine that worked in uh, at the cup teams in, on the high end where his budget was like $7 million a year to develop some parts in the cup engines and uh, he didn't, he was, he learned a lot. He was really smart, but he said it wasn't because he was smart as much as it was because the team owner spent a lot of money on the development of those parts. And it was his job to use that money wisely and learn what they could. So it ended up making him an expert without him getting the, the ECM download from the good Lord to make him the smartest guy in the world. Even though I think he's one of the smartest people in the world, but, uh, if you work on something for 40 years every day, you clock in and clock out every day for 40 years and you work on the same thing and the same stuff, you'll figure out a lot of things you're doing wrong. You'll figure out a lot of things you're doing right and you'll do some things wrong so many times that you won't ever do it again. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Charlie. This is a big valve, y'all. Everybody can see this big valve, right? Well, this is, this is an in exhaust valve. And this is the intake valve that goes with it. So I want you to see that the size of a valve is relative because this is actually a little valve and this is a big valve. So I don't know if you can see all this stuff, but these over 2.7, almost 2.8 inch intake and a over two inch exhaust valve. This is a 2.1 exhaust valve. This exhaust valve is bigger than what a big block Chevy, small block Chevy, or a Harley, or a Hemi. This is the big, bigger exhaust valve than they run. This is 2.1 for the exhaust valve, and this one's 2.75 for the intake valve. The relationship between the two is pretty normal. I don't know the percentage off the top of my head, but 70 to 80% intake size to exhaust size, and that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit this evening. Everybody tuned in so far? Okay. Um, I wanted to tell you all that, uh, again, this is great to see this many folks' names, Stephen, Ken, John, Roger, see these names come up. It's great to see you guys on here, Corey. I wanted to uh, say hello to you guys, a few of you, before I go to the page and talk about what the subject matter for our Tech Talk is today. I also wanted to thank you guys for coming in late that can't make it here dead on time at six o'clock Eastern, five o'clock Central. Please know this will be up on my page. Uh, you can go back and look at it. Also, Jackie will record this 
and she will put it on YouTube. And I think it's called Star Race GA, Star Race GA, maybe Star Racing GA. But you can find it. Hey, Jay. Hey, Shane. But you can find it, Ed. You can find it on uh, YouTube and all of the episodes, I think there's over 110 or 20 episodes on YouTube that you can go back and refer to. And I try to come up with new content every week and sometimes it's a little bit overlap where uh, some of the subject of one show may get into the area of the other show and this is a different kind of overlap, which we'll talk about. I know that was kind of hokey. I'm gonna turn this camera around right quick and go to the board. Hmm. Well, that's one way to do it. Please deal with my fumble. If you can. Tech Talk Tuesday. It says rotate your phone. There you go. Tech Talk Tuesday, number 132. Everybody looking? Everybody see? Okay, Kevin, Joey, Rick, story time. Yeah. The story today is going to be about valves. Um... When s and cycle came to us, when we were Team Winston back in the early 2000s, near, two, near 99, 2000, we were really doing well with the Pro Stock Motorcycle for the Suzuki program. And there were some s and guys out there that were doing really good. They were learning really fast. And I think it was uh, Tom Bradford and uh, Linda Jackson and David Fazell and John Miller. And some of those guys were really... Uh, trying to make something of the old school engine, the old 45 degree V twin. Then I think John Miller and Fazell got them a 60 degree. Maybe, maybe uh, Hiles got it also with Rob. Uh, those guys were doing a good job trying to figure out how to make a 60 degree. Work. There are several people out there. I don't want to drop names and 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 leave one out that's so important in all of that learning. But it's good to to realize how far we've come and SNS came up with a 60 degree and they wanted to know the bore and the stroke and why it would need to be what it is because SNS as their career as their style as their history was to add stroke so you get more power more torque and the reason was back in the day we didn't have uh engine cases big enough to handle a big bore pattern so they created from a clean sheet of paper with a giant bolt pattern I'm talking about they put a big hole in the case and it left room for tons of meat for us to put all kind of bolts to hold the cylinders on and the heads on. It had four main studs. The studs in each cylinder went all the way down to the crankshaft and came all the way out the top four of them and they were able to hold the head on and then there were also bolts that went to the cylinders in between all of that to hold the cylinders to the case. But the crankshaft was tied to the cylinder head by once you put the cylinder on, this big bore cylinder where it went down in, the, down in this case. We were able to bolt the head on and we had nuts on top of these big studs to hold the head on. And every other stud had another bolt to hold it on. So we had eight bolts holding the head onto the uh, cylinder and we had four studs holding all up together through to the crankshaft and then we had eight bolts holding the uh, uh, cylinder down to the crankcase. Now we didn't invent that. s, &S didn't invent that. That's something that the industry had been doing for a while to get big bore, but they didn't, nobody really understood how big of a bore could be had back in 99, 2000, 2001. So the new s, &S piece came out with the standard bore for their pro stock engine was 5.125. Now that's a big bore. That's five inches, five and an eighth inches for the bore. And that allowed this type of package to get in there. Which what stops engines from running 
making more power and what doesn't, I mean, once you get a biggest bore as you can and a stroke to make the rules. The rule was 160 cubic inches, so they made the bore the biggest they could and then they made the stroke make up the difference. And then the RPM is controlled by the valve train ability to turn high and also the piston speed controlled by the crankshaft stroke. So it ended up being 160 cubic inches with the biggest ever heard of, biggest at the time, 5.125 bore. Now, if you took a five inch bore and put a 2.8 valve in it and a two valve, that's 4.8 worth of valve here. Let me see, let's do the math right quick. I did not bring my AARP calculator with me, but let's see, somebody do the math for me. 2.1 and five, 2.1 and 2.8. What does that give you? Four, one, five, one. I'm gonna let y'all add it up for me. Y'all got me? Intake, let's add them together. 2.8 intake valve and a 2.1 exhaust valve. That is four, three, that's 5.1. So the bore, this right here, this bore, was all the way full of valve. Intake valve was this big, the exhaust valve was this big and there was no more room in the bore or the chamber for bigger valves. So mission accomplished. Problem was that we had you guys, Daniel, John, Gunner. Yes, that's right. It's 4.9. You're right. So we did. Thank you very much, Gunner. We had room over here for a little bit unshrouding. The exhaust valve actually hung right off the bore. But the industry says to move the intake valve away from the bore. He writes, it's a good thing I did not. I'm not a math scholar. I think it was 4.9 inches of valve in a 5.1 bore. That's right. Okay. So most engines in the world have canted valves. This this uh, SNS engine was almost straight up. It was 6 degrees, 6 degrees, and then they tilted 6 degrees so that you could get a little, get the, you wanted the intake valve, when it would open, it would open to the center of the bore and not sit on the side of the bore. The exhaust valve would open to the center of the bore and not sit on the side. So if it was straight up and down like a small block Chevy where the valves were going straight up and down, they would be shrouded by the bore every time a valve would be, the valve would be up against the bore and you would open it to full lift and it would still be against the bore. And you'd close it up against the bore, open it up against the bore. So when you can't the valves, not like you can't do it, but can't, like you would tip them over, they would can't away from the bore as the valve opens. And you hope that somewhere during the travel of the intake valve that it would find the center of the bore so that it would have 360 degrees of op opportunity to flow all the way around the valve. Exhaust, you can it, tip it over as well. Then you would end up with clipping clearance on overlap. And a big two valve engine like this, where you got only one intake valve and one exhaust valve per cylinder, when you do that, you have to run a lot of camshaft. And when I say a lot, I'm not talking about lift, I'm talking about duration. So you gotta put a lot of overlap in it. That means you gotta open the intake valve really early and you got to leave it out there as long as you can. And then when the pressure equals in the port and under the valve, when the piston's coming back up on the compression stroke, you slam the intake valve shut. Problem is the exhaust is still trying to do the same work. The exhaust is trying to open during the power stroke when the intake is closed. So the exhaust valve opens. And then right when the, when the intake valve is getting ready to open at the end of the exhaust stroke, the intake valve opens and, and they run into each other. So that's clipping clearance. So we had to sink. These valves are both completely used up. So if you hear me clinking them and you're getting mad and it makes my skin crawl, it's like rubbing your fingernails on a, on a chalkboard. These are absolutely beyond service. Uh, we ran about 50 runs on these valves and we'd have to throw them out. And we'd run about 70 runs on the exhaust and we would throw them out. So if you hear me clinking and clanking, these are valves I pulled out of the trash. Really and truly they are. All right, so the fact that the, the intake had to open before it needed to in order to give the engine a chance to get full of air, the exhaust valve would open before it needed to in order so it could have a chance to get all the exhaust out before you had to shut it. And that created overlap, which created clearance problems here. Not only did we have clearance problems from the intake valve to the piston, 
when the intake valve would open. And not only did we have the exhaust, the piston coming up on the exhaust stroke, getting close to the exhaust valve, we had valve to valve prob, uh, interference issues, and we had piston to valve interference issues and piston valve interference issues. Also, we wanted these to be far enough away from the bore where you could get some good flow. I know I went over that a lot, didn't I? Okay, I'm gonna drop this camera down a little bit so that I can maybe see this too. I'm gonna get rid of this little drawing and I'm gonna break out some information on this exhaust valve right quick. This exhaust valve, I don't know if you can tell how long it is, but here's our standard dry erase marker. Valve is really, really long. And you know, you would say, well, why is the valve so long? Why is this valve so long? Why are they so long? I'm gonna draw a little side view cutaway of the cylinder head. It had a six degree can on the exhaust and a six degree can on the intake. So I'm gonna just draw kind of a side view of how all this looks. And these are not true valves. These are really shaky old man valves. All right, can you see this okay? Maybe, okay. The piston dome and the piston valve pocket had the same angle on it so that if they were to collide, it wouldn't bend the valve. Hey William, hey Chuck, Robert, Jack. The valve is long because we wanted to get a, a lot of port in it. So let's do the let's do the exhaust port first. This is grossly exaggerated. And then we would have a valve spring pocket cast or billet in here so that we have room to put a big spring, a retainer, and the locks. When this would open, <laughs> this is crazy, y'all. This valve, this exhaust valve had 1.2 inches of lift. We were running a 600 lobe with a 2 to 1 rocker ratio. 2 to 1 rocker ratio. And so that means that we would squeeze this spring down 1 inch 200 before we would stack it up. That would open this exhaust valve 1.2 inches. Okay, can you see what I had going on here? And this would be fully compressed. Now, the reason this valve wouldn't have to be this long if we change the architecture of this port a ton. And we made the port a little tight exhaust port like all the other heads in the world have. And this is really pretty extraordinary to be able to get this much spring in it. But if you can put the valve longer and you can make the head taller, you can move the spring higher, you can make the port taller, and the air loves to go in a straight line. The exhaust wants to go in a straight line. As a matter of fact, if we could make the port look like this, we would because the exhaust wants to go straight. The exhaust hates to turn. It's coming out at unbelievable pressure, probably 800 or 1,000 PSI. And there's some guys that are really smart on here that know that stuff. But when, depending on the fuel and the use, really depends on what you are trying to do with that valve and how much pressure is in there. There's nitro guys out there running right now that have nitromethane burning in their engines and they have an exhaust valve. And when the pressure inside the cylinder is so massive amount of pressure that the valve, this valve won't even hardly open because if you have a, a rock arm, a, a push rod, and you have a rock arm here and you're opening this valve with this roller rock arm, and this push rod says open it and this pushes down on this, the pressure inside the cylinder with nitromethane is so huge that this valve won't even hardly open off the seat. The push rod bows, rock arm bends, and it's, it creates a mess. So there's been a lot of technology over the years try to get a nitro engine to have good exhaust valve train where it can open the valves when it wants to and close them when it wants to without wadding up parts. But back to this into, uh, exhaust valve. This is a 2.1 exhaust valve. If you'll look real careful and real close, you'll be able to see that this is not a 45 degree angle. Oh 
my hands are shaking. Either you all making me nervous or I'm old or I'm hungry. But anyway, a 45 degree angle is laid over halfway between the 90 here and the 90 here is 45. But this valve job, it is shaped like a, I'm gonna get this thing to, to show you in a minute. It is shaped like a wine bottle cork. There you go, almost. This valve is 60 degrees, this angle is 60 degrees. We've run 65. So if you have a valve, let's make a giant valve, a drawing of a giant valve. There's a cutaway of a giant valve. This is, of course, the chamber, this is the stem, and a 45 degree would look something like this. It's gonna be halfway between the direction and the face, it's a 45. All right, <laughs> we used a 45 on them forever, and we used 30s, 30 degree, we, we ran 30 degree, we ran 40, we ran 45, we ran 50, we ran 55, we ran 60, we ran 65, and we kind of stopped at 65 degrees. 65 degrees is, it's not 45, it's not 30. We stood it up all the way to 65 degrees, and it seems like it wouldn't hardly seal there because if you know, look right here, a wine bottle cork is shaped like this. It's big at the top and it's tapered, and you try to shove it in the bottle. Well, if you have a, a valve job that has an angle where it's so steep that the valve could get stuck in the head and wouldn't come back up and down. So as far as opening and closing really easy, a 30 is easier than a 45, a 45 is easier than a 55, and a 55 is easier than a 65. And what we learned was, if you make the valve job, if you make the port, like for the flow bench, you make the exhaust port where it comes in and has a real nice radius valve job. Put a real nice radius valve job here. And then you put a 45 degree here and a 45 degree here and the valve sits on this. This area here is really small because we made this really nice valve job where it has 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, and we put a really, and then on the flow bench, this real nice, gentle, big radius flows a lot on flow bench. But in reality, our exhaust is, is trying to get out of there and it needs area. So we put the exhaust port as big as we could at the valve job. And we took this 45 degree and we stood it up to 65. And then it, the valve was sunk so much that we got us a longer valve and we, we put it in the, in the engine and we moved it further down in the hole, further down, and we stood it up with a 65 so we could make more area here for the exhaust to get around. And the flow bench can't flow 1,000 PSI or sonic or whatever it is when the pressure comes through the exhaust port, it can't get there. So we would make the throat really big on the exhaust. Uh, if we had a 2.1 two valve, we might make the throat just inside of that on the exhaust because it wants area. When this valve would open, it wanted area. All the area it could get here. It didn't care how it flows at 28 inches. It didn't care how much air it flows at 28 inches. All it knows is it's got 800 or 1,000 PSI or somewhere in between back here. And when this valve cracks daylight, it needs bam. It needs room. Have you ever seen a really big exhaust system leak by the exhaust gasket? It's got a lot of pressure in there. Back to the intake. This intake here has a 55 degree on it. And I'm going to tell you why we put a 55 on it. One reason is, is because it's the industry standard, a 55 degree. So this looks like a 45 compared to this. And this intake valve, I'm gonna, call, I'm gonna just say it's 2.8 diameter, okay? And this is how it looks on a cutaway. It's really big, here's the margin. Let's say the margin's 50 thou. Let's say we got a 55 here 
What time you got, Jackie? Five minutes. Five minutes? God, time flies when you're having fun. And then you got a back angle on here, say 12 degrees, and you got a 55 right here. And then you got a nice radius, and then you got this big long stem. Okay, on this intake valve, this is all titanium. What we did was we had the manufacturer rifle drill this with a really big hole all the way down through here. And this stem on this valve is hollow. And they make a plug that goes in the top. Here's a cutaway. You got a piece of tube. This is a piece of tube. And then they make a plug that has the keeper groove in it. And they plug it in and then it's fusion welded here. And the stem of this stem is fusion welded on this. So this is probably three piece valve right here. A lot of folks don't know that. Yes, you can buy one piece valves, but when they're this big, a lot of times it's a three piece valve. This is a piece of titanium that's completely made correctly. I don't know the exact engineering terms. Here's a piece of titanium tubing that has been rifle drilled straight through the top and it stops here. And then a nice hardened piece is pressed in that has the keeper groove in it. And it has a nice hardened tip on it. We would run a lash cap on this anyway. But there are some valves out there running around right now that a lot of folks don't know about that are hollow head and hollow stem. You can take a head of a valve and make it shaped stout like this where it will not deform. And you can cut the center out here and hollow all this out. You can hollow all this out and then, and you can drill this hole through the stem. So you got all this is open and all this is open. And then you weld the disc fusion, weld the disc back on right here. And that makes a really, really strong and really lightweight valve. And according to my timekeeper, I'm going to be running out of time pretty quick, but I wanted to, I got a lot more to share with you about this, um, valve to job, valve to valve, and these uh, shapes and sizes of these valves. But I got one more thing that I wanted to tell you about. It's a new announcement, and I'm gonna try and do this. Right, there is a new announcement. I got the mic. There's a new announcement that the, the cams, the 485 3030 cam, and the 585 three quarter cam, and the 615 full race cam for the Milwaukee eights are selling great and working good. But we found, not by ourselves, many people helped us, but we found a gap between the 30-30 and the three-quarter. This is a hundred thou lift difference, but there is a big gap in where the intake valve closes and the exhaust cam can even be pretty wild. But we have a new cam coming for the future. It's in development now. It's not ready to sell. It's not ready to talk about yet, but I'm getting ready to drop the mic on this. It is a 572. Bam, coming up, 572. May God bless, have a good night.